Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, as we continue on in our series, our 4K series, Luke 8, starting with verse 40, it says, Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him. When he had returned, a crowd had welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, the synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. As he was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, approximately the same amount of years of this young girl who was sick. But no one could heal her, the Bible says. No one. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. And immediately her bleeding stopped. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to delve into your word. We thank you for these text messages that we get to read all the time. And right now we want to focus on one of the texts that you sent us. May it impact our lives. May it be transformative. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. Have you ever been in a situation where you're wanting to get the facts straight and you tell someone in conversation, that is not what you said. You actually told me this. And if you have the, the ability to do so, because maybe the conversation took place in text messages, you can take a screenshot and show them. And show them that they were wrong, right? Anybody been there before? I used to be such a screenshotter. Ooh, I was annoying. I would screenshot and say, well, on Tuesday at approximately 3.42 p.m., this is what you said. As if courtroom theatrics work in relationships, right? They don't. They don't. And so it's interesting that this story seems to have screenshots. <laughs> this story would have some conflict with the other gospel accounts of this story. Now, the most important details are present in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, but I want to look at the other gospel accounts of this particular story because they have threads just slightly nuanced that are different enough to point out why they should be included and why they are special. So again, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark. Mark has a screenshot of the situation and it differs just a little bit from Luke. In Mark, in Mark's gospel, it also says that, that, uh, that there was a large crowd around him. Jairus had come to him in verse 24. He had come to him, asked him, and so Jesus went with him and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. You notice how Mark said they pressed around him, but Luke said they almost crushed him. Which one sounds more violent to you? The almost crushed him, right? It's a different scene. Being pressed up against, people, a large crowd following and pressing up against you, it, 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 it almost, it just sounds, it sounds, it sounds like there's more decorum. It, it sounds like something that would happen on a Sabbath morning, right? It, it, it sounds like the, the crowd isn't rambunctious or uh, 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 too excitable. But Luke's account wants us to understand that this large crowd is clamoring to get to Jesus. They were expecting him, they knew he was going to arrive, and they were doing all they could in their power to get close to him. Would it be safe to, to assume in Luke's account that everyone was touching Jesus? As many people who could possibly touch Jesus were touching Jesus, right? If they're crushing him. But Mark says they, they were pressed around him. And there was a woman who was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now, they all have that account. It's been 12 years. She's a woman, and, and she was bleeding. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew what? <clears throat> now, 
there's something important about Mark's account because now we know that she's had enough money that she's been able to spend it on, on what we would assume is quality health care and no physician was able to help her. She had run out of money. So this is a woman of great means who had finally run out of money and now Jesus appears to be her last resort. Now you have to understand something. A woman that is bleeding nonstop would be considered unclean. According to the law of Moses, any time women were on their cycle, they could not be out in the public. They could not be in worship settings. They had, they had to quarantine themselves and wait for everything to finish. And this woman was unable to stop the bleeding. Now, you need to understand something. I hope most of you are not too queasy here, but you have to understand that when a woman was considered unclean, not only, not only could she not uh, participate in worship services and go out to Trader Joe's or anything like that, but she was not able to even have relationship with her husband. And it's interesting that in this story, it seems that her husband is not her advocate. Her husband is not the one that is going out to Jesus and saying, Jesus of Nazareth, my wife has been sick for 12 years. Can you please just lay hands on her? Can you please just say the word? There is no one to advocate for her. Where in contrast, Jairus is going to Jesus and saying, my daughter is sick. She's 12 years old. She's sick. Please touch her. Heal her. It's nice when we have people in our corner to advocate for us, isn't it? But what about when you don't? It is safe to assume that this woman of great means no longer has enough money. She's now probably a person of poverty. She's ostracized from her community. She can't hang out with anybody in public. She's seen a curse as, as, as cursed by God. It is most likely that her husband has divorced her. He can't be with her. And she's all alone, and this is her last resort. She finds out that Jesus is passing through, but she's not the only one who knows that Jesus is passing through because everybody knows Jesus is passing through, and we know this because they're all around him, and they're not letting anyone get close enough. Right? So here you are, a woman who cannot be out in public. The community already knows that you cannot be out in public. Anyone you touch would be unclean. And people are pressing up against Jesus to the point of threatening his life. That is how much they're clamoring for him. And this woman wants an audience with Christ. The Bible says that when she heard about Jesus, remember she had grown worse, not better, but grown worse. When she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. And Mark adds a detail that I like. He wants us to know what her thinking is. She touches his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, what would happen? I would be healed. Matthew says, says the exact same thing. In Matthew uh, uh, chapter 9, 18 through verse 21, Matthew records it the almost exact same way. He has, he has a screenshot of Mark's uh, account. She said to herself, if I, in verse 21, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Now I have a question for you. Where in our heavenly Father's Name, what in God's name gave her the idea that if she touched the threads of Jesus, that she would be made whole? Is there a story anywhere in the Old Testament that I don't remember? Was it Elisha or Elijah, the handkerchief? I mean, what, what made her think that if she touched 
his garment that she would be made whole. Last week we talked about God doing it again, right? Jesus doing it again. Remember he, he, he fed the 5,000 in chapter 14. So in chapter 15 when they were around the 4,000 families and the disciples were asking the question, what are we going to do about feeding them? Christ is like, are you serious? Just like maybe a month ago we fed 5,000 families. He will do it again. We were challenged to sit down, sit down so that we can receive the blessings of God. That, we, that our act of sitting down is an act of faith trusting in God's providence, trusting in his provision. So we sit down. That's why they ate. They sat down. And the God who did it in chapter 14 was able to do it again in chapter 15. The God that blessed you in your 20s, that got you through your schooling, is going to get you through this situation at work with your coworkers. We trust that God can do it again. But what about when we're faced with situations where we've never seen him do something? We have no testimony to base it on. Why would we conjure up in our mind this probability? This woman believed that if she just touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she would be made well. So I want to just explore for a moment this type of faith. The faith that has us believing in something we've never heard of before and we've never seen. Now, this is the tough part of faith. In fact, most people, they look at those who go to church and they say, you guys, are, you guys are crazy people because you believe in a God who is invisible. You've never seen him before. You've never heard his voice. And, and you believe that he created all things. And I, I always find this so funny because it takes just as much faith to believe in evolution as it would in the Bible, Right? You get on my case for believing in an invisible God, but you believe in an invisible moment that you've never seen, you weren't there, and you believe that something came out of nothing, right? You believe in nothingness creating something, right? That's what evolution believes. And they think for a second that that makes so much scientific sense. Except in the real world, everything that we come in contact with, the pews that you sit on, the carpet that we stand on, the roof that is over your head, required someone designing it, putting it together thoughtfully. Everything that we come in contact with has a designer, including the flowers, including the trees. It's not an accident. And, and, and I might be able to work my mind around like one accident happening, but billions and billions of accidents happening spontaneously, combusting, to create life, and not just, not just plant life, but animal life, organisms. And even if we were to go on the microscopic level and to see what that world looks like, it is beyond reason. And so I tell people who believe in science and trust, put all their faith in that, I'm just, I let them know, you, you, you have to have as much faith in your science books as I do in scripture. They said, how do, you, how do you know who actually wrote the Bible? You don't even know who those people are. They could have been making stuff up. I said, how do you know who wrote your textbooks? Right? Have you, has anybody met the authors of their textbooks? The scientists that were a part of, the, of, 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 uh, of, of sharing their data and their theories? When we look at science books and history books, do you know there are, they are influenced by the people who funded those studies? You can read American history that was written in 1860, and it will differ from the history that was written in 1960. And if we started writing new history books today, it would still differ. You want to know why? Perspective. It depends on who is telling it, who paid for it, where it's coming from, what their agenda is, it all depends. I've, re I've read studies where they say the first human remains oh, were, were found in the North Pole. I've read studies where, no, it's in Africa. It depends. And at the end of the day, you still have to have faith in the people that pin these textbooks. Again, you're going to have to have faith no matter what. Faith simply means trust. You're going to have to have trust 
no matter what. And most of us will have to trust in the invisible. We will have to trust in what we have never seen and what we have never heard. How many times you've gone on the elevator and you can't see the mechanisms behind it all? Right? And yet you still get on the elevator and push a button. When I was a kid, it was like magic. I didn't understand what was going on. And when it was explained to me, I still didn't understand what was going on. But I know this, I go up and I go down when I push a button. Right? So the evidence for me is that it works. The evidence for me, I always say this, the evidence for me that there is a creator is that you see the creation. The evidence for me that there is a painter, I see the painting on the wall. The evidence for me that, that, that there is a sculptor is I get to see the sculpture. That's how I know. And nobody in their right mind is going to tell you that painting on your wall came into being all by itself. Just wait billions and billions of years, it'll all come together. They would laugh at you. And yet we who are far more complex than the paintings on the wall, people think that we spontaneously, out of nothing, were formed. And so we get on people's case for having faith, but you have to understand this woman has had her experience with science and medicine, and it had failed her. Hello? She had her experience with science and with modern medicine in her time, and it had failed her. She had experiences what her money and what they what, what, what her money could purchase for her and now her money has failed her at one time she put her trust in her husband because he would be her protector till death do them part and he had failed her and it is very possible that she was never able to have children because of this issue so she has no kids to advocate for her. She is all by herself. The things that were visible have failed her. So now she's between a rock and a hard place. And she has to believe now in the invisible. I will tell you that most of our faith comes from a place of desperation. Most of it. When Peter jumps on the water, you think he's just trying to have a casual evening stroll? No. The boat is sinking, and the disciples are screaming, and he believes they're going to die. So he decides to go on water with Jesus, who seems to be calm. You think Moses really had to, to argue with God about the scientific improbability of the Red Sea being able to be parted when the Egyptians were on the attack? Absolutely not. Right? Absolutely not. Moses, just stretch forth your hand and the sea will part. Whatever you say. <laughs> no point to argue in that moment. Finally, Abraham gives in and starts laughing when God says, even though he's 100 years old, you're going to have a kid. And he says, man, whatever, <laughs> whatever, Lord. Oh, you think that's funny? Yeah, it's funny. You know what? Your son's going to be called laughter then. We'll see who gets the last laugh. We often get to a point where we've exhausted everything that we possibly can. And so now we have no other choice but to trust in the improbable. This is the part where faith really takes root. And I love it. It doesn't make any sense. Most people would have laughed her out of their apartment if she told them what her plan was. I know Jesus is coming by, and I know it's going to be a large crowd, but girl, I just know if I could just touch a thread. <laughs> be like, what? So I want to give you the secret sauce. The first thing that makes this whole faith experience pro probable for her, impossible for her, is that she got moving. It is not faith if you don't move. You want 4K faith? You want that crystal clear faith? It is not faith if you do not move. The only reason why she got in the vicinity of Jesus is she decided to leave her comfort zone and move towards Jesus. Amen? We talk about having faith without any action. And I'm telling you right now, as was shared in the children's story, that two must work hand in hand. That's why Hebrews 11 
as, as uh, Pastor John shared in that audio clip, Hebrews 11, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we move in faith. We will purchase things because we know that God will make sure we can, we can make the payments. Do you know, I, I'm not sure if you guys caught that in the clip, they bought, they bought or built a sanctuary that was three times as large as their congregation. Are, are you hearing this? They built a sanctuary that was three times as large as their sanctuary because they believed that if they built it, people would come. That God would fill this place, and they did so. So it's not faith if you're not moving. So don't tell me you believe if you're not moving. She moves. The other thing that she does that makes her faith spectacular is that she risks. It's not faith if you're not willing to risk. It's not faith if you're not willing to risk. When you find yourself in a situation, you say, oh boy, if I make this move, if I really put myself out there for you, Jesus, oh, I could, I could be ridiculed. I could be, I could be cut off. I could be ostracized. If it's real faith, there will be real risk involved. Most people are wanting to make faith decisions without any threat of risk or loss. It's not going to happen. When God called Moses to lead his people, was it risky? Was it risky? When he tells Abraham, without giving him any plans, tells Abraham to leave his home and that he would bless him and he would make him a great nation and his descendants would be like the sands of the shore and the stars of the sky and Abraham had not had kids up to that point, was it a risk? Absolutely a risk. Was it a risk when Jesus came to this earth? Was it a risk? Absolutely it was a risk. If he had failed, he would have lost everything. He would have lost us and he would have lost the universe. It was a risk. Jesus made a move in faith, knowing, knowing that he was risking everything. But this is the beautiful gospel message. You ready for it? You were worth the risk. And that's why he took it. Now, were there things that Jesus lost in, in coming here? In his act of faith, were there things that he lost? Absolutely, according to Philippians chapter 2. Jesus will always bear the marks and scars of his humanity. But we were worth it. So it's not faith if you're not moving. It's not faith if there are no risk or threat of loss. And it's not faith without a little imagination. This is what we've lost, I think in our community of faith. We've lost imagination. Many of us are so beaten down by life and how pragmatic everything has to be and that, Pastor, this would never, ever happen. This is how we think as human beings. This is why the disciples challenged Jesus. Well, we can't feed all of them. We, we just, we have, remember last week, we just have some small fish. That's it. But it takes imagination. Moses had to trust that God would do what he had never seen happen ever. You'll part the Red Sea? Okay, let's go. Moses, who had been trained as a soldier, was trained according to uh, the, the ch uh, uh, chapter 7 in the book of Acts. He, he was a military man. He knew how to get what he needed. But God came with a different way of battling. Moses had never seen it before, but he had a trusted family. You need to have a little bit of imagination. There are some of you right now that are struggling in relationships, struggling in your current financial situation, struggling with health issues because you don't have the imagination that God can do greater. That God could exceed whatever your hopes and your dreams are. Believe that if, if, if you can think it, if you can imagine it, God can do it. Ah, that, didn't, that, didn't, that, didn't, that didn't warrant an amen at all. If you can imagine it, God can achieve it. 
He tells us that he would give us our heart's desire. He tells us in John chapter 15 that whatever you ask in my name, it will be given to you. He tells his disciples that if you pray with just a morsel of faith, faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And most of us read this and we think, oh, he's being symbolic. But the symbols that he's using are communicating a reality. If he says that, we, he, we, that if we have just a, just a seed of faith, that we can move mountains, he's saying whatever the mountain is in your life that you believe is unscalable, unpassable, he's saying I can remove it so that you can pass through. We are not experiencing the victories that we are destined to experience because we do not have the imagination, we are unwilling to move, and we're afraid of experiencing more loss. So we stay right where we are, in the boat. I'm not leaving. I know I'm drowning. I know there's a lot of water in this boat. I know it looks hopeless, but I do not have enough imagination to get out on that, that water with you, Jesus. I don't have it. This woman said to herself, if only I could touch the hem of his garment. So the Bible says that she touches the hem of his garment and she is healed, according to the Gospels, she's healed seven days later. What does it say? In the moment, Matthew 9, verse 22, Jesus says, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Luke says as soon as she reached out and touched, she was healed immediately. Now, I love the aftermath of this because something happens in this that I, that I think unlocks a whole other level of faith. So she believes that she touches the hem of his garment, she'll be healed, right? That's what she thinks to herself, right? She touches, she's healed immediately, and then she tries to get away. Jesus stops everybody and says, who touched me? Luke 8, verse 45. Who touched me? When they all denied it, I don't know, what, all 10,000 of them? When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, people are crowding and pressing against you. Now remember, Luke said that they were crushing him. And Jesus asked who was touching him? It, it makes me inquire a little bit. You can touch Jesus and not really touch him. That's too deep. I know that's too deep. You can be pressing all around Jesus, rubbing up against him, arm around him, holding his hand, and yet still not touch him. Everybody was touching him, which by definition, everyone should have been healed of their infirmities, right? But not every touch is a touch of faith. So a lot of us will touch Jesus, stay in touch with Jesus, show up at church and sing about how in touch we are with Jesus, but never touch him with faith. And we wonder why we're still experiencing our life as it was before Jesus. Well, I was walking with him. I was so clo close to him, I almost crushed him. You see, it's not enough, family, to simply be here. I applaud you for being here. Great job. We just started prayer meeting. We just started prayer meeting uh, last Wednesday. For the six people that were there, I applaud you. But it's not enough to simply press up against Jesus. You see, our actions without faith are dead. There must be something to that touch that is imaginative. There must be something to that touch that is trusting. There must be something to that touch that has a holy confidence, knowing that by talking to Jesus, being around Jesus, my life will be transformed forever. Jesus says, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Most of us don't remain in Jesus. We remain around him. 
and family, we need to be challenged to have the faith to touch Christ, to, to, to reach out in faith knowing that God can heal you of whatever you have. Now, listen, I know right now some of you are going to say, Pastor, you're sounding like a Sunday preacher. What we need to talk about is that Jesus is coming soon. Oh, he is. And he can heal you of all your infirmities. But you need to talk about the truth, Pastor, and prophecy and how we need to get ready. Oh, no, no, yeah, 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 yeah. You need to be ready. And he can heal you of all your infirmities. But, Pastor, what you need to talk about is prayer and the power of prayer. Absolutely. And how when we pray in faith that 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 prayer and faith, according to James chapter 5, will heal you and restore you. You see, we are not experiencing all that we are supposed to be experiencing in our faith, in our community of faith, because we really don't have faith. And that's just the hard thing for me to share with you. Because I know there are people here who prayed for certain things to happen, and they didn't happen. And I know, I get it, I get it. Sometimes God does say no, I get it. Sometimes he straight up says no, we have, we have scripture to prove it. Sometimes he says no. But I want you to know that there are so many times in scripture that people just would not take no for the answer. Remember Jacob, who wrestled with God all night long? God said, leave me alone, let me go, daybreak is coming, and Jacob said, no. I will not let you go until you, until you bless me had God in a headlock. Remember the Canaanite woman? She asked Jesus for help. Christ, Christ ignored her. She kept begging. The disciples said, Lord, send her away. She's, she's embarrassing us. Right? You guys remember this story? And then what else happened? Christ said, I'm here for Israel, not for, the, not, not for you Gentiles. She kept begging. Then he said, it's not right for me to take the food that belongs to the kids and throw it to the dogs. Now listen, where I come from, I grew up in the IE. I grew up in the Inland Empire. And then I spent most of my ministry in Oakland. I can tell you right now, there's not a lot of people, not a lot of women you can just roll up to and call them a dog. And not get scratched up. Jesus straight up called her a dog and she like, <laughs> you tripping. Because I already know this is some kind of act. I know, I already know it's not because I'm a Gentile, because I was on the centurion's IG, you know, story, and I saw what you did for his servant. And I know it's not because I'm a woman, because I went to high school with Mary and Martha. So whatever you're trying to do right now, Jesus, I ain't fooled by it, because I'll take the crumbs. See, that's faith. What did Jesus say? Oh, woman of great faith, what you want will be given unto you. There's so many times in Scripture, remember our, our series on Elisha, how he wouldn't give up and would not leave the room until the boy came back to life. He was following the example of Elijah in a similar situation with a dead boy that would not leave the room, got on top of the kid to keep him warm, and would not leave the room until the boy came back to life. I'm telling you right now, faith is persistent. It does not give up. It's imaginative. And if you know God well enough, you will not stop praying. You will not stop asking. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 says, Jesus told them a parable to teach them that they should always pray and never grow faint. Always pray and never grow faint. And it was about a wicked judge who didn't respect God, did not love people, and a widow that went to him and said, oh, I'm pleading for my rights. I'm pleading for my rights. And Jesus said, this wicked judge got worn down. And he says, if I don't give this woman what she wants, she will drive me crazy. And Jesus says, listen to what the wicked judge says. How much more will your heavenly father not give you good things? If this is what a wicked judge will do, how much more your father who has emptied out heaven for you? What father among you would give your son a, a stick or a rock if he asked for bread? If your earthly fathers know how to give good things, if your sinful, evil fathers know how to give good things, how much more your heavenly father? Do you know who you're asking this of? This woman was so convinced that Jesus would heal her that she didn't even ask him. She just touched his threads. And Jesus says, who touched me? Who touched me? Now, I like the way that Luke says, he, Luke says he wouldn't give up until he found out. He kept asking around, who touched me? Who? Who? 
Finally, the Bible says, and we're closing on this, finally the Bible says that the woman comes forward. Verse 46 of Luke 8. Someone touched me. I know that because power has gone out from me. Peter, I'm not talking about that kind of touching y'all been doing. I'm talking about the touching that, that causes power to leave my body. Now, you need to understand something. This woman did not ask to be healed by Jesus. What she essentially did is pickpocketed a miracle. She snuck up behind him and went like this and said, thank you, and walked away. It was Jesus who went, whoa, 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 whoa. Someone just pickpocketed me. What are you talking about, Jesus? Someone just pickpocketed me. What happened? Someone touched me. Well, Jesus, we're all touching you. No, but power left me. Someone stole your power? Yes. Someone stole my power. Who did it? Ooh, she was afraid, the Bible says. She was, she was just trying to be quiet. She was like, she froze. She wasn't going to move. Ooh, I hope he doesn't notice me. Jesus kept asking, who touched me? I want the person who touched me to come forward. Someone touched me. Power left without my permission. Whoever touched me, come forward right now. Christ wasn't going to give up. So finally the woman came forward. The woman, the Bible says in verse 46 and 47, it says, Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed. Amen, that Jesus notices you. That you could never go unnoticed. Not even if you tried. She came trembling. And she fell at his feet in the presence of all the people. She told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Mark says she told him everything. She just told him the truth. Oh, this is what I did, Jesus. I tried everything and everything failed me. But I heard about a man called Jesus. I heard about you. I didn't want to trouble you, and I, I didn't want to defile you because if anyone I touched, I would be unclean. And so I was just, I was just thinking if I could touch your clothes, I didn't see anything in the law permitting, you know, uh, not permitting me to do so. So I just want to, I was hoping to go unnoticed. Nobody really notices me anymore anyway. People haven't seen me for 12 years. My husband left me. My friends have left me. But I hear the people you hang out with. I hear about what you can do. And I just wonder. Then he said to her, not woman, not sister, daughter. My, my precious daughter. Your faith has healed you. Jesus doesn't say, I healed you. He says, your, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Family. This kind of faith can restore families. This kind of faith can restore our physical well-being. This kind of faith can restore our emotional and mental. I believe it. And I know you've had issues. Some of you are like, I've had issues for longer than 12 years, Pastor. So be it. Use a little bit of imagination. No, I'm just going to trust in science and I'm going to trust in medicine. I'm, gonna, I'm not telling you any of that stuff is bad. I'm just telling you what is better. And some of it just doesn't work. And where that has failed you, if NyQuil has failed you, if your anxiety medications have failed you, I'm just saying, try them out. 
touch him. If the therapist has failed you and, 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 and you can't see his opinion and he can't see your opinion and divorce seems like it's the only option, I'm just saying, just try. What do you have to lose? Everybody's already left. You have no more money. Try Jesus. 2,000 years ago, this woman wasn't the only one with the issue of blood. Jesus also had an issue of blood. And he took all of our issues and he bled out so that we could be redeemed. So that he could heal us. And there is power in that blood. Do you believe that church family? Do you want to experience that church family? Do you want to experience a faith that can transform your circumstances? There is power. And we want it, we want it to leave Jesus. We want it to leave heaven right now. There's someone here today that wants to make that stand. There's something you're going through, something you're struggling with, something you have an issue with right now, and you've tried it all but you've never reached out with this type of faith. And you want to right now, I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet as we pray. I know if you stand, people are gonna look at you and go, ooh, you got issues. I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm standing right now. I'm standing right now. Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Father, you see those who are standing. Father, you see those who are standing. Right now, Father, we just give you again all of what we have. We're reaching out right now in faith. We're just going to believe that you can do it. You said it. We're going to trust you. Oh, Father, not that medicine is bad or that science is bad, because, Father, your miracles involve science and medicine. We know that. You understand all of it. But, Father, where medicine has failed us, where we have no other recourse. We're just, we're contending with you right now and we'll wrestle with you until you bless us. Bless us, Jesus. Oh, we're not trying to sound too emotional. We're not trying to sound Pentecostal. We're just desperate. And we need you. There's power in your blood. Wonder working power. And we submit to that now. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say, Amen. Amen.